Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bharatiya and we are here at KubeCon in Detroit and today we have with us once again Billy Thompson, Solutions Engineering Manager at Akamai Linode. Billy, it's great to see you again. Right on, thank you for having me. Yeah, we saw each other a few weeks ago at Linode headquarters, so I like this. We should do this, this frequently, right? Yeah. Perfect. So let's talk a bit about, you know, we are here at KubeCon. As we talked earlier, also you travel a lot for the events. Talk a bit about what has been your experience here at the event. So this is actually my third KubeCon. And just like the first two, I have observed that it seems like the majority of the attendees here are people who are new to Kubernetes. So they come from companies that are looking to explore adopting it, whether that's because they're on something antiquated or they've identified a problem that it could solve for them, or they're just looking to future-proof their success in the cloud. They're sending people to these conferences who are here to learn, and then they're coming back to their companies and bringing back what they learned. And so we're really excited to have conversations with them. Tell a bit about you know, what kind of presence Akamai Leno has at this event. So we have a booth set up, but we also sponsored a workshop on getting started with Kubernetes by Nigel Poulton. He's the author of several books and training courses that have helped well over a million students get started with containers and Kubernetes. So he did a intro to Kubernetes workshop, as well as an exam cram for students pursuing their certifications. Yesterday, he did a lightning talk and book signing. And on Wednesday, he did a booth quiz. Excellent. Uh, talk a bit about the Kubernetes offering by Linode. So the Linode Kubernetes engine, which started in late 2019, it is a stable, mature product that is production ready, but is also very, very easy to use. The barrier to entry is very low. And in Nigel's own words, it's one of the easiest that he's ever used. And so when I just brought up people that are looking to explore Kubernetes, and they're going to go back and have these conversations with their teams, when they come up to our booth, that's one thing I want them to leave with, is to understand that not only is it something that they can run their production workloads in, not only is it a cost-effective way of running Kubernetes, but it's really easy to use. You are here at the conference. Uh, I'm pretty sure that not only you met a lot of vend or the vendors, competitors, your friends, a lot of users also. So talk a bit about what are some of the pain points that you are hearing from users? Some pain points I'm hearing relating to what I just said, just kind of that barrier to entry. Um, and their experience being, it seems very complicated to get up and get started and get testing. But also, I think that Kubernetes itself for newer users is kind of overwhelming. It's kind of intimidating in a lot of ways. And I think why that is, is because I think a lot of training material kind of starts with the core of how it works. You know, when you bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster, there's this explosion of things that happens, you know, and then the kubelet and the kube API server and trying to follow along and follow the flow of data and stuff. And it seems like a lot at first. But what I tell people is that start small, start using it. And I think that you'll start to figure out that when it comes down to it, you know, if you're managing it yourself, even if you're managing it yourself, the point is, is that it's an orchestration engine. It does these things for you. A lot of really, really smart developers donated a lot of time to do that. So once you start using it, it becomes more clear that, oh, this isn't that bad to use, actually. Like, it boils down to, I define what I want in some YAML manifest, I feed it, and it gives me my desired results. And when you start thinking about it that way, it becomes less intimidating. And you know the whole idea of managed services with other providers where people would rather pay a premium to just kind of set it and forget it so that they can just focus on their application. My argument is more, if you can use something like Kubernetes that orchestrates and does things for you, you create like your DevOps pipelines and so on. And once those are down, you know you tweak them here and there. But for the most part, you have something that manages your infrastructure. You have the layers of abstraction, the networking. And you can still do that, that whole just focus on your application. And Kubernetes helps enables that. And so I think that's a pain point is people aren't realizing that. And they're feeling intimidated, but they just know that this is something they need to do. And I'm just kind of like, calm down. It'll be OK. Like, just give it a shot. Start small. It'll unroll itself. I don't necessarily think it's more difficult to learn. I just think it's something new to learn. That is you know, basically the, the pain point. And if you go and walk in the booth here, you'll see 
so many logos, so many vendors, which also good because the ecosystem is rich, but which also makes it difficult for user because you know they have so much to choose. I mean, sometimes choice is good, sometimes choice is not good. That's when managed services come at play because they don't really have to worry about all that complexity. Talk a bit about, you talked about your Linode, off, sorry, your Kubernetes offering is mature. Is it production ready? If it is, then you know, once again, how you make it easier for things, how, like you talked about pain point, right? To address those pain point and uh, what makes it production ready as well. So the simplicity, right? Just like our other products, we have a web UI we call the cloud manager. You can easily deploy that there, define your different node pools and so on. But what makes it more production ready is also it can be deployed through our CLI tool, through our REST API, through our Python and Golang libraries, and through our Terraform provider, which means that you can deploy and manage LKE clusters programmatically and declaratively and version control. It also supports cluster auto-scaling, so you can define your desired amount of nodes, and this is per node pool, that it can auto-scale to the maximum amount that you define should you need more resources for an increase in your workload. And that can be defined by how pods are scheduled with user-defined criteria on things such as CPU resources or node affinity and anti-affinity and so on. And then as of the beginning of this year, it now supports high availability control planes. So that is redundant control planes giving you four nines of uptime guarantee. And those are things that make it production ready. Can you talk about, uh, you may or may not be able to share name, you know, some of some production workload use cases of LKE. Just to name a few that come to mind that I've seen an increase of over the past year. Education platforms, IoT, big data and ad tech, been seeing a lot of that. Uh, plethora of different SaaS products. And uh, a lot of serverless computing, a lot of people moving off of Lambda and using frameworks like OpenFOSS, Fission, and Knative. You're kind of a regular at KubeCon. Of course, there was COVID, so there was a gap of two or three years, but did you see any kind of pattern? I do remember before COVID, there was increased focus on security. People were starting to talk about security in the Kubernetes space. The, the whole idea was in the cloud native world, security is not an afterthought. It's you know, not someone else's problem. So there used to be a lot of session. Then they, we started to having a dedicated days. Are you seeing any new you know, patterns emerging where you're saying there's an increased focus on these aspects, and that's where you also see not only there are increased sessions, but they're also bringing you know whole days dedicated to that specific area of cloud native. I'm seeing an increase of security entering the realm of Kubernetes in the sense that that's where a company is deciding to go and want to put their applications there. And the development team and the security teams are usually separate. So when they're kind of already doing that, they're like, yes, we're putting it in Kubernetes, and then somebody goes, okay, what about security? There's always that guy, right? And so I'm seeing more material come out, um, videos, trainings, courses, tutorials, and so on that talk about network policies and security policies and so on. And I think the, uh, there's a Kubernetes certification just for security, and I'm starting to see that become a lot more prevalent and more people specifically going to pursue that maybe sooner than they are pursuing the certified Kubernetes application development cert. The whole you know, emergence of term DevOps you know, it started with the whole cloud journey, AWS. The fact is Linode kind of predates AWS, but uh, let's just you know, give the credit where it is, chaos engineering, Netflix. Um, now we are talking about DevOps, DevSecOps, SREs, and now we are saying DevOps is that long live you know, uh, platform engineering. From Linode's perspective, because you yourself run a massive infrastructure internally, you are not only provider of this technology, but you're also consumers of these technologies. So what do you think of evolution of these terms? If you can talk about, yes, we love to coin these terms at a regular pace, but this is the problem that we are trying to solve. So the problem that we're trying to solve is a problem that I see, and this is my one of the largest issues I have with the product native ecosystem that's happened with the industry is we see that people are developing applications 
to make it work with products on cloud platforms. And I think that that's just absolutely backwards. I think cloud providers should be providing tools to work with your applications. You should develop applications the way you want to develop applications, and they should just work. So what we do is we provide a way that you have total control over that. You have control, total, total control of how it works, the security of it, so on. That control stays within your hands. You see the whole life cycle of it, and we're just a platform that empowers that, that flexibility, that portability. There's nothing that you have to change about it to make it work with us. How is Linode making it easier without compromising on the flexibility that you get when you want to use these components, whether it's Kubernetes, GPUs, Linux? So I would say, like, first off, like, what I define as the cloud, right? Because, yeah, technically, anything you're accessing over the internet, Gmail, something, right? be considered cloud because you're not accessing something on site, on-prem. But what I think of with cloud computing are on-demand resources, right? So on-demand compute, storage, DNS, things like that, that are easy to scale, that can be ephemeral, that can be programmatically managed, right? Declaratively, that can be version controlled and so on. Like that's really the advantage of the cloud and the ability to scale and the cost effectiveness of it. But then where this becomes a big problem with the hyperscalers that not only make that really expensive, I've been seeing articles about how people are leaving the so-called cloud because of their experiences on the hyperscalers, and they're realizing, wait a minute, this is actually more expensive than it was when we were co-locating in a data center. So they got the advantage of being able to scale very easy, but they didn't get the cost benefits of it that the cloud promised. And then there's the complexity part of it, where companies are trying to hire but they, they can't just get a DevOps engineer, they need to get an AWS certified DevOps engineer. And so it's more difficult to hire, there's more people that have to learn, so just the barrier to entry is higher. The amount of screens that you have to click through, the amount of options to pick from that aren't always very clearly explained why you would want one over the other. So what we do at Linode is we just simplify the process. We have affordable pricing, it's flat, it doesn't change with what region in the world you deploy it in, and take like block storage, for example, on other providers, they may give you 11 different options. This one's throughput optimized, this one's IOPS optimized, this one's this and that, and which one do I pick? Where do I start? This is complex. We just give everyone the same lightning fast NVMe block storage. It's simple, it's easy to use. So by lowering that barrier to entry, we are empowering more people to actually get the benefits of those on-demand resources that the cloud has to offer. Billy. Thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about your presence here and also talk about some of the pain point that folks are facing because you know the fact is that you folks predate a lot of this cloud native world that we are seeing here. And you have been helping customers, not only where they are in their journey, but also who they are. They can be you know, big you know, com tech company or individuals who just want to run a local shop, but they want a web presence. So thanks for sharing those insights. Thanks for making things easier and simpler for folks. And as usual, I would love to talk to you again. Thank you. All right, thank you for having me.